We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and this has been a day, yo. Like, it's been a weekend. <laughs> yes. So much has happened, and it's only the middle of the afternoon on Sunday. I know. It's absolutely insane. This is like, I know in our prediction podcast, we're saying like, oh, you never know what's going to happen because of weather. (laughs) But like, this is so unprecedented and so insane. This is not what I thought we were going to have. I thought we would have like a little rain effect, you know, the the weekend, but not completely postpone quality and completely change race time. Um, What a weekend. What a wet and wild weekend. Yeah, I mean, it was... It was so much happened. I mean, we had so many red flags just like today, Sunday. We had six red flags. Which like, is insane. Like, that's between absurd. quality and the race, but still. Right, like, and yes, five of them even, were in quality, but holy crap. Right, like, I can't even wrap my head around, like, what happened. I have to, like, reference my notes and my phone because it's, like, Normally I can keep everything in my head, but there's just so much going on that I just, I, I can't. I cannot. Yeah. So we don't really have a lot of, or any news. So we might as well just dive on in. And did you remember that there was a sprint Oh wait, the race? one thing that we should talk about is what? before we go into this, K-Mags was sick. Oh, so, I, I forgot about, yeah, K- I 100% I <laughs> forgot about K-Mags. So K-Mags was sick and Ollie Behrman, the gem that he is, hopped in to driving responsibilities. He got a phone call at like 6.30 in the morning of like, hey, you're racing. Yeah. <laughs> you are in for this sprint, maybe for more. Honestly, though, this is why I bring it up. If I'm, <laughs> if I'm K-Mags, I'm like, Thank God I'm not racing this weekend. Like, yes, he's sick, but besides that, there's so much craziness. So obviously wishing him well and hoping he's feeling better. Probably not having to participate is making him feel better. Also, if you're feeling sick, being out in the rain is like the last thing you want to do. So um, yeah, yeah, that's like the only thing I wanted to highlight. Oh my God, I totally forgot. I know, right? Right? I think it's also because we're just... I, at least for me, like, I'm ready to see Ollie in the car. So I'm just like, oh, yeah, Ollie's a house driver. <laughs> Even right. It's like, not. it's it's the third time we've seen him this season. Just that, it just, it just makes sense. But yeah, he was, he was funny. Cause like, this was also like his first F1 sprint weekend. First rain. And his race. first rain race. And he was talking about how he spent the qualifying delay watching Max Verstappen in the rain race in 2016 just to like He's see so how cute. it was just like I was I was studying up and obviously that uh Verstappen uh rain race was kind of a foreshadowing moment for how he performed today but we'll get to that in a minute first we have to get to the part that I fully expected which was Red Bull shooting itself in the foot with the sprint can I have my can I have my tinfoil hat theory for five seconds before we yes. get into that Yes. Okay, so again, this goes back to my theory from weeks ago that they're just going to make K-Mags disappear and Ollie's going <laughs> to take over all of his responsibilities. And I just, I feel like his illness might continue, even though now we have a three-week break. Yeah. I don't think he's going to be better for Vegas. I would just like that to be out there. But I can, I mean, I can still see it happening. So I'm still tinfoil hatting that we will see Ollie Behrman again before the end of the season. Yeah, I mean, it, it wouldn't surprise me. Obviously, we have we have three races left. We know K Mags isn't going to be racing, so it would not surprise me if Haas makes that move. Obviously, K Mags came out and said in a statement that he'd be racing in Vegas, but we have multiple weeks between now and Vegas, so we never know. He's gonna be um, definitely ill still. Yeah, he's gonna he's gonna continue to be uh, diseased, and yeah. So we had a sprint race, and we did have a sprint race. it was kind of a downer. I mean, in the comparison to the race race, yes, but also just like, I was not ha- comfy with the way it ended. I understand why it ended the way it ended, but I didn't love it. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. So, McLaren is dead set and they fully believe that Norris can overtake Verstappen in Drivers' Championship, which, like, that's not going to happen, right? Because not anymore. Have pretty, not well, exactly. Today. But still, I think that's really 
pardon my French, super shitty of McLaren because it's like such a long shot. And if you want Oscar to drive with the team, you got to throw him a bone every now and then let him win a sprint race. It doesn't matter that much. It's one point different for Lando to Oscar. Lando needs so many points to catch up to Max. Like it's, it's, it, I think it's horrible what they're doing. Cause it's like, you need to keep up team morale and you do that by letting the driver who had a better start and a better qualifying and just a better race in general, you, you let them reap the benefits of that. And that made me annoyed. Yes. And as the Max Verstappen fan of the podcast, I also didn't like it because of that. But I also understand the other side of it, which is A, going into the weekend, Lando was on the the upswing and he he had more of the momentum. And not only that, but the thing that, that we forget to talk about with the whole Verstappen-Norris battle, obviously going into the weekend, it was 47 points between them. It's not anymore. And Lando needed to outscore Max by 12 points in this each of their next four weekends, which right. obviously did not happen. But the other thing that doesn't really get talked about as much is Charles Leclerc is only 24 points behind Lando Norris. And yes, they'll be going to Qatar, which is a track that does not suit Ferrari, but we still have Vegas that does and Abu Dhabi that does. And Ferrari has been on this surge, you know, other than this, this weekend in Port Carlos. This weekend's an so, anomaly. Let's just so, throw that out there. So, so the so Ferrari is still going after the the constructors championship, and Charles Leclerc has officially been ruled out of the drivers championship mathematically, but he can still get P two, and he, you know, Lando is at more risk of losing P two to Charles than he is at taking P one from Max. But the storyline right. of Lando taking P1 for Max just looks better because, you know, Brit- you know, Max has decided that the British media now hates him. So there's Honestly, that. though, I'm in that same boat with Max. Like, I was telling you, I am not Max's biggest fan, and I can tell everyone is out to get Max. And, like, everyone oh, yeah. is out to ruin they, his chances of becoming the, 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 uh, the uh, FIA right. and the stewards are were doing everything they could this weekend to benefit Lando over Max and the like the VSE infringement was kind of legit but also kind of a cop out because he didn't even overtake Oscar anyway so it right. kind of felt like a whatever that said they applied a penalty to Ollie Behrman when he um, crashed into Colapinto in the Grand Prix race, even though it didn't neg- negatively affect Colapinto's race. Colapinto negatively affected his own race when he crashed, but that's unrelated. Poor right. Williams, poor, poor Williams mechanics. Oh, but know. so, so Red Bull did not get off to the best start. They didn't even have the best qualifying, which qualifying was supposed to be Saturday afternoon after the sprint race, but then was completely and totally deluged out and rescheduled for 730 in the morning, local time this morning which was 3 30 in the morning for me and yes I did wake up for it and no I was not happy about it okay here's the thing we all know I struggle with time zones time is hard and I so I on my watch I have Texas time and I also have VA time VA time I finally figured out why I fucked this up VA time is the same as Sao Paulo time So I'm looking at my watch thinking like, oh, yes, okay, it's at 7.30. Set my alarm for 6.45, got up, made a coffee, sit down. And like I hadn't looked at my phone completely with all my notifications. And then all of a sudden I look at it and it's like, it tells me exactly what happened. And I'm like, what happened? (laughs) And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm such an idiot. I set my alarms for the wrong time. But thank goodness I record everything because I can't trust myself. So I just sat and and rewatched it, but, um, holy qualifying. Yeah. There were five red flags, Colapinto, Sainz, Stroll, Alonso, and Albon. And Albon's crash was so bad, was so bad that he couldn't even, they couldn't even get his car fixed in time for the race. Then Colapinto crashed again, Stroll crashed and then beached himself on gravel, which he really didn't have to go onto the gravel in order to get back into the formation lap. So what was he doing? Question mark. I know. And I think, so the thing with qualifying, it's multiple drivers had multiple comments about how like the conditions were terrible 
Yeah. And I understand we have to get through qualifying, but, like, after what number of red flags do we just call it? (laughs) Because it's, like, we could have used FP1. And, like, for, again, this is all a safety thing, right? Like, imagine some of these crashes were super bad because of conditions. Like, that would be on the FIA for saying, oh, yeah, we can race in these conditions. I personally think, although I know everyone's going to say, no, no, no. It would have been safer and better to just take FP1 and then go into the race. To have them have to McLaren would have wanted spike. that too. Right. Well, I'm sure a bunch of people like would be either happy or upset about it. But at the end of the day, five red flags. Imagine if all of them had concussions and all of them got really, really hurt. Because that's very a reasonable thing to say. In these conditions, you you know, hydroplane, you can't control the car, you don't know what's going, what if they hit another car and something happens, like, I personally think that the FIA got really lucky for holding qualifying in these conditions. Yeah, exactly, and and the, the other thing about this is, well, why didn't they just go to FP1, and the re- one of the reasons why I believe is a, they had the opportunity to do qual, or they felt they had the opportunity to do qualifying, and obviously we were able to set the grid. And even if we were only able to get through Q1, that would have been enough to set the the full grid for for qualifying. The other part about it is that it wasn't explicitly written into the sporting codes what to do if qualifying doesn't happen. The the idea of like, we'll just use the, the most recent practice session, whatever, that isn't explicitly in the sporting codes yet. It will be next year, but it wasn't in it yet. So they were really relying on the fact that they could schedule qualifying Sunday morning for like the sixth time in in modern F1 history and just knock it out real quick and then go into the race, which is definitely not easy, especially since they also pushed back the race time 90 minutes because it was originally scheduled for two o'clock local and they started at 1230. Which is crazy too, because they've only done that like a handful of times. Yeah. They haven't done it since we had a Grand Prix in Dallas, which, like, that's not a thing. Yeah, um, in 1984, and they moved it. I love that, like, this year they moved it because the weather was going to be super rainy. In 84, they moved it because it was going to be too hot. Yeah, the tracks for Dallas. Which is very Texas of them. But it was it was just so much, like, and so Lando got pulled. Max Verstappen, you know, very publicly was upset because he got caught out from the Lance Stroll induced red flag at the end of Q2. And I, I read into a little bit of why they took so long to deploy the red flag. And the, the reason was basically like Lance Stroll hadn't actually stopped moving by the time that the, the cameras came on, he was, you know, stuck in the wall, but what that didn't show was that he was still moving around and trying to get the car, you know, back on track. So that is why, and I can see the reason why they would not red flag it even if some people like Max Verstappen would have wanted that immediate red flag and why they did wait longer to confirm that the car was not going anywhere yeah I mean you could say he was still moving but I would say it's minimal like I'm in Max Verstappen's camp of like why wasn't this a red flag sooner it took them a long time and I still think 40 seconds even though he was like moving see okay big sigh from my dog (laughs) even though he was like moving he like truly wasn't and there I mean he wasn't going to go anywhere so did they need the full 40 seconds no I don't think so and I think it's interesting the commentators from Sky Sports were saying that they thought they were keeping the red flag so that people could finish their their lap time time, yeah which is also interesting because that really affects other people and them not being able to do, I mean, I don't know. Because it's not only that, but, but what was the cutoff for which drivers could finish the laps? Because Max was on a lap, Perez was on a lap and they both got caught out in that. So why, why were the laps of the other drivers more, you know, you know, worth it to having it be be finished, uh, you know, while, while Max uh, wasn't. And obviously the FIA has been very mad at Max these last couple of weeks because of the way that he's been racing and the penalties that he's been given. But 
should that, let's say, bias follow him from weekend to weekend? No, and see, that's what that's where I start to struggle with F1 as a sport is, like, someone gets their panties in a twist and they start, like, biasing their decisions because they don't like what someone said about X, Y, Z, or they don't like their attitude, or they don't like this and that. And it's, like, it's ridiculous. And for them to come out and say that Charles just got a fine because he apologized, like, that's bullshit. I'm sorry. Oh, they yeah, both he's... swore on live TV – they both should be held accountable for the same thing, regardless if there's an apology from one side or the other. Like, Max got a much harsher, like, punishment than Charles did because, allegedly, it was taken into account that Charles apologized. Yeah. And like, I'm like, his apology whatever. was like, oh, he was like, oh, sorry, you're not supposed to say that. Like, it wasn't a true apology either. It was, like, off the cuff. And, and like, like, what kind of so apology stupid. did they want from Max? Did they want him to, like, prostrate himself on the tarmac and say that he swears to never swear again? Like, And you know exactly. what? I, I usually don't like petty behavior. I mean, it's entertaining, but it's annoying. But I think Max has every right to be petty about it because it's stupid. He's like, oh, well, I can't say anything. I'll talk to you outside because, like, if I do it in here, I'm just going to get in trouble, which is true. He's, he's stating facts. If him, like, if he wants to say what he wants to say, he will get in trouble. He's not being truly petty. He is a little bit. But he's also telling the truth of, like, I get in trouble for anything I do. So why would I subject myself to that? I get it. I understand. I would be so frustrated if I was Max. Yeah, no, I, I I agree. And even, you know, listening to the the end of race commentary where a certain Sky Sports commentator was on his high horse about how Max has, you know, got more talent and ability in his little finger and still drives like a, you know, angry person sometimes and why he has to stop doing that. And I'm like, you raced 11 races in Formula One, you can stop talking. Um, well, and if you don't like, know who I'm talking about, then just look up who the race commentators were and it wasn't Crofty. Well, and the other thing too is like, if you don't like his attitude great no one cares what you think like he can be annoying and he can be an asshole and it doesn't matter because he's good at racing like if Zhou Guan Yu was a pouty little child about everything and maybe he is we don't really get a lot of coverage of it on him no because he's, he's always in the back, in the back. Of the pack. but like there's nothing to justify or back up that behavior Max honestly I'll let him get away with murder because he's so talented and he can back it up clearly he started from 17th and he won. Like, go home. I'm sorry. I just, again, I'm not a Max Verstappen fan. Actually, this season's kind of- I mean, he's kind of growing one. on you. <laughs> he is growing on me. But at the same time, it's like, I feel like everyone, and honestly, I blame the popularity in the US, but everyone is picking him apart. I feel like it didn't used to be like this. And now all of a sudden, it's just like the media is picking everything apart of everybody. I hate it. Yeah, speaking of media, he he mentioned there's a quote floating around from the post-race press conference where he's like, where did all the British media go? Did they did they leave? Did they forget that there was a post-race press conference? Because <laughs> obviously he he feels that he does not get a good a fair shake from the British media outlets who are obviously in favor of British drivers yeah. um, and a specific British driver who happens to wear papaya. But we'll talk about him in a minute. Um, before we get into the race, I want to start off with a caveat and we'll check on this before the end of the episode to see if we have any updates but we have not yet gotten any rulings from the stewards as of our recording time because we have things to do tonight um so we do not know yet about what the FIA and the stewards are going to say about the investigation into Lando Norris, Yugi Tsunoda, Liam Lawson and George Russell for leaving the grid during the aborted start procedure at the very beginning of the race and then we also don't know about the rulings from the stewards of the investigation into both Mercedes cars and the way that they were changing the tire pressure because apparently you're not allowed to change the tire pressure while the tires are still attached to the car which they did for both um, Mercedes drivers yep. on the way to the second start procedure which is apparently against the technical directives according to Bernie Collins's impressions during the broadcast she said that this could be something that they would get that they could get disqualified for because of the type of directive that it is so that could still happen it's 3 30 in the afternoon Arizona time on Sunday and we still haven't heard anything about any any summons yet we'll check at the end of the episode to see if there there has been any updates but as of now there has not been even so it would really only impact you know constructor standing wise and it wouldn't impact a lot 
Yeah, it's kind of a nothing burger. Like, it's not because we could have two more people be disqualified because let's not forget Hulkenberg was disqualified. <laughs> yes, he was. <laughs> um, that good old black flag coming out today. Uh, honestly, what flag wasn't? wasn't out meatball today. was not thrown out meatball wasn't out but other than that every single one was um but yeah pretty it's much kind of like it, none of this really affects anything so yeah that's why we're i also want to point out just fun fact wise the race finished 14 minutes shy of the race time cutoff so if you don't know there's a set amount of time that the race can be raced during and as soon as those like four hours are up the race basically gets you know completely cut off and with the red flags and the rescheduling we were 14 minutes shy of that end time yeah wild day okay so many things happen and it's been a minute since we've done these but it is time for the max verstappen record book portion (laughs) of the podcast please take it away let's hit the record the record book highlights so he won as we know by 19 seconds after not being within 19 seconds of the lead for many many months he this is his first win in 10 races it's been a minute um and this is like the longest streak in max's career that he's gone without a win which is wild this is only the fifth win in formula one history and we've had over 1100 formula one races this is only the fifth one from 17th or lower on the grid the last time this happened was kimi raikkonen winning from 17th in japan in 2005 we love kimi raikkonen it doesn't surprise and, me that it was kimi <laughs> i know right like he he was such a good driver just in a time before we got into formula one mm-hmm. and uh, let's see what else. Max Verstappen, he had 17 fastest laps during the race in which he started in P17 and has now broken the record for most consecutive days leading the World Drivers' Championship, breaking Michael Schumacher's record of 896 days. As of today, it is 897 days. And considering we have three weeks until Vegas, that time will just keep going. He is also the first F1 driver ever to win from 10 different grid positions. He's won from P1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 9, 10, 14, and now 17. Like, honestly, it's kind of impressive that he can win from 17. Right? And like, not only win from, from 17th, but win from 17th in one of the most chaotic rain races where very easily there could have been another red flag that would would have sent you know Esmen Akon back on his back again yeah but so here's it I don't think if we had all this wild crazy wet conditions I don't think he could have made it from 17th to win I think oh I fully agree his, those were in his favor because if this was like a dry race there's I don't think there's any way he could have moved up 16 positions no no I I completely agree this 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 really is an environment that suits him really well and clearly he has shown that you know he's had some really good rain races and he's had some really good rain races in brazil yeah so yes and he's now 62 points up on lando norris and can clinch the title for his fourth driver's championship next week in vegas or not next week next race in vegas if only it was next week and now lando mathematically can still win the championship he just has to outscore max by 21 points in each of the next three weeks which let's be real is not gonna happen no okay and then to round out our podium i don't want to talk about this too long because i don't think they deserve the airtime i know i I was i was gonna say like now we have to we have to talk about (sighs) alpine god sg best you took p2 which like i don't know how i do know how because quali was insane and he ended up at in p4 after for quali and he just kind of stayed up there um and then pierre got p3 i will give him a little bit more credit because he did start from p13 but at the same time like i just don't care the only thing that's notable about them making podium is that they combined got what 30 something points 33 33 points math which shot them up in the constructor standings they were in p9 because we all know alpine has sucked this year now they're in p6 they jumped three places and that alone if they stay where they are now which probably they will Um, it boosts their prize money $50 million, which is wild. That is, to me, the only significance of them getting P2 and P3, besides the fact that 
it's a reminder that Alpine exists. <laughs> but yeah, it this this was something that nobody saw coming. Like this this was the first time that an Alpine driver raced in the top five this year, let alone the fact that Esteban Ocon led the race at one point. And not only did he lead the race at one point, but he was pulling he was like four seconds ahead of Max at one point. And Max was starting to get his tires going after that restart. But really like Aston Akon could have been like gone with the wind bullseye and we never would have seen him again. And it would have been an Akon Verstappen Gasly podium instead of a Verstappen Akon Gasly po- podium. I don't know if I'd give Akon that much credit, but <laughs> maybe. I'm just saying maybe. Max was not gaining for a very long time. This is also the, the first podium with two French drivers on it for the first time since Spain in 1997. And also Alpine as the general institution brand that includes Renault with their first double podium since like 2006 which is just wild because 2006 is of course when Fernando Alonso won the world championship with Renault yeah I just think the most telling piece of all of this because normally everyone's like yeah we're gonna win like yes we're going for the win um as on his radio at the end he's like we did not see this coming and his engineer was like yeah no absolutely not like this was not what we thought we would have where we thought not we'd even be this close. Weekend. Not even close. So I just I think it's funny when teams can also just be realistic. Like James does the same thing. James is very realistic about their you know chances and they just want to get in the points. But like McLaren's always like, oh we're gonna go one two. Like oh even last season when they sucked at the beginning, Zach's always like, oh yeah we're gonna go for the win. We're gonna win. Um, yeah. I just think it's funny how five Alpine, pit stops later. Alpine was like, yeah no this is not. Mm-mm. I was We're not good enough to be here. <laughs> I was just waiting for like something to happen to the Alpine drivers. Like I was waiting for George to overtake Gasly. And now I know that the Mercedes had many, many problems this weekend with with setup and Lewis's weekend was just a nightmare. And somehow George managed to to get that car into P4, which may, he may or may not still keep. We'll see. But I just I was waiting for Gasly to get overtaken. Yeah. It was just, I don't know. It was a weird weekend. So like, weird. Honestly, okay, I know this is going to send a curveball, but, like, I wasn't truly impressed with anyone besides Max. And? and I wasn't either. And? And? Show Guan Yu. You want to know why? Because he me finished why. the race. <laughs> <laughs> Not, like, he's, he, I don't know if he's really truly DNF'd all season. Like, on like there's been like car um, issues or maintenance issues but it wasn't like him crashing you know what i mean and i just think that's great i'm very I proud mean, of him you you might be you might be right i mean he's only had two retirements this year obviously it doesn't the the thing doesn't say what i i could look but i'm not going to because i don't care that much positive he has not crashed and it's all because of mechanical stuff like the something I think, was wrong with the car i think you are right i'm just checking right now to see if we have any updates from the stewards and it does not look like we do Uh, but no I think you know him coming granted he ended in p15 and five people retired so that is last place but you know I think I still think it's good on him for making it through well and and I would I would agree with you and and not to say that that he's a rookie but to to lead into disappointment you know this race was really tough on our rookie drivers and you know Joe was. was far from a rookie but he is a younger driver but Colapinto, Behrman and Lawson too all struggled Colapinto crashed twice in the same in in the same day unfortunately also his grandfather passed away at the very beginning of the weekend I'm going to get him a so pass sad. on this weekend like I'm also oh. but like just in general, for the the drivers who are new to the grid this year, this was not an easy race for them. Not no. an easy environment at all. I mean, Ollie Behrman got a 10-second penalty for hitting Colapinto and two points to his license in Kevin Magnuson's car. So it's it was it was really, really tough for them. And the fact that, you know, Behrman and Lawson managed to to finish the race in general is is credit to them. It was just this was a really tough weekend. Yeah, I, oh gosh, and like, it was, it, it broke my heart just seeing Cola Pinto, like, visibly upset, even just, like, going into Friday. Yeah. Um, for him just to, like, participate and get through the weekend, I think is a really big thing. He's so young, you know what I mean? So, it's, 
not saying like anyone's grandfather passing away is going to be different on your age, but still he's, I see him as a little kid still. So that's so hard. And, um, you know, he had so many fans there because Brazil's super close to Argentina. So that was cool for him. Oh, they, they sold um, out flights to, to Brazil sure from Argentina. There were more flights too. Cause that's what they do too. So they, they had like 30, their people took 30 hour bus rides. Like everybody, the, the, the contingent of fans from Argentina was just amazing. Yeah, no. So I feel really bad for him. And you know, it, it's it's hard. This is a hard track. We knew it was going to be a hard track going into the weekend. The conditions and the rain was were only worse make than we thought. So yeah, I mean, a lot of, I mean, ha- what Behrman and Lawson actually finished the race, and there's a lot of veterans who didn't. So I don't know. And Colapinto, I'm giving him a pass all weekend because this was his head wasn't in it. You could you could tell too. So yeah, and and this is this is also not the first time we've had Formula One drivers who have lost family members. Michael and Rolf Schumacher, like I think their mother passed away on race day years ago and they they still race. I think my, I think Michael won the race, which tracks for him. But like this it it's just yeah, that, this this was a really tough weekend for for Colapinto um and take some time and then we got Vegas. Yeah. Also, someone else I want to highlight who did not have a good weekend. And I feel very justified in bringing this up. Check out. Yes. I'm sorry. But if Max can start P17 with the same car as you and win the race, why can't why can't you get finishing the points? Why can't why can't you, why can't, you why can't you overtake Liam Lawson for the love of all that is holy? Oh my god, I know. Like at this point, it's just like frustrating to watch this, which is that makes no sense. But I think it's frustrating because like Danny lost his seat. Danny was never like bumped up, and I like Danny more than Checo. And like I want Cola Pinto to have a seat next year, and he's driving really well, and Checo's not. But Checo has a seat next year. Like, right. just either retire or sit with the fact that you're going to get fired and someone else is going to take your seat. Because, like, to me, this was the nail in his coffin of he should not be driving next year. Like, and also, how do you not get frustrated as Red Bull? Because you only have one driver dragging you to the finish line for constructors. Right. Like, he has not done anything to help contribute at all. Like, I, I just think it's so inexcusable to be in that car and have the experience that you do and continually not get points. Yeah, it, exactly. And and obviously, Max is a better driver in the wet and can do things in that car that nobody can. So th- there is that slight caveat. You mean like pass but, eight cars in one corner? <laughs> yeah. And, and then I, to, to the point where in the cool down room, he's like, I didn't even see Checo when I passed him. Like yeah. that's just that's definitely a little ridiculous. But yeah, th- this was this was really a continuing not great showing from Checo, and the, the guy was in the points with a point for most of the race until his fight with Lawson ended up getting him overtaken by Lewis, who had a nightmare weekend with the car that all he was doing was complaining about how bad it was and how bumpy it was and and everything and the, just the the way the the setup was not conducive to the way that this track had been resurfaced and I don't think the track was resurfaced. Very very well either so it's it was really really not not a good look at all no but also hold on I want to just take a look at this Checo qualified and he was he started in what p12 yeah p13 yeah he started in p12 max started in p17 how like you have the same freaking car. I get that he's better in the wet, but still, like, he moved up 16 places. Why can't you just move up two and get a point? <sighs> I don't, I don't, I don't disagree so with you. It's, ridiculous. it's, as, as a Red Bull fan, it is very challenging to watch the max side of the garage that goes from P17 to P1 and then see the Checo side of the garage, which is not doing what a Red Bull driver should be doing. Like that's why Red Bull is currently third in the constructors championship where they should not be at all. It's, it's just, it's exhausting. Honestly. It is. 
and it yeah it's it's oh I don't know and and here's the thing because you could say like well Emily there's a lot of drivers who like aren't as good and they shouldn't be in their seat like Zhou Guanyu understand Lance he's Stroll. also in a sour you know what I mean and like the Haases are the Haases and the Alpines are the Alpines but like you're in a Red Bull yeah I can't it's so frustrating anyways we can move on from my Checo rant yeah um I also want to add for disappointed and there there was really no way for them to know this but McLaren's McLaren and Mercedes decision to pit Lando and George Russell during the virtual safety car because it ended just as they had already pulled into the pits which is what led to um, Esteban Ocon taking over lead of the race with Max and Pierre Gasly behind him. That just did not work out in their favor at all. And no, but I still oops. don't think that's fair to say it's a disappointment because like that's just a strategy thing. You didn't, they didn't necessarily know the timing of the virtual safety car and that's just such a crapshoot. I don't, I mean, yes, that affected the entire race, but if it was, if they had pitted like one lap later, it would have been completely different. You know what I mean? Right, exactly. No, the, the the real disappointment on the McLaren side was the fact that Lando just completely bend it. And we know that Lando is not the strongest driver in, in the wet sea, that Russia race that he should have won. But this, like, this, this was not Lando's day. And this was really not the day that McLaren was hoping for in the Lando Max battle that really wasn't. So, oops. And then to move on from that, because... What else is there to say? Nico Hülkenberg's black flag to disqualify him during the race was the first time that we have had a black flag since Canada 2007. So it's been a hot minute. But Nico Hülkenberg is now one of the few Formula One drivers who has a DNF, a DNS, and a DSQ on his uh, on his record. Good for him. And still no podium. And still no podium. <laughs> yes. I'm sure um, there's another record there. <laughs> I mean, he, he still has the F1 record for, I'm pretty sure of, of, you know, longest tenure oh, yeah, yeah, driver no, without, a, without a podium. Yeah. Sure does. He, he, he has, he has had it for a long time and considering he has signed a contract with Sauber Audi, he, that, uh, that time will continue unless Audi can give him like a miracle car. Cause he's not going to get it in the Sauber. Yeah. Okay. Should we get into our predictions that we just completely bombed? Yes, it, and yeah, we we did we did not do very we didn't well do good. At, so at sprint weekends, drivers get the opportunity to pick up more points. We also get an opportunity to pick up more points in our predictions. However, we picked up a whopping zero. So which, None honestly, points. I'm I'm not surprised because of the conditions, because of how like turned around everything was. I feel like we may have been able to predict the sprint podium, but I digress. Well, I think we we could have gotten. I think we could have gotten pole, and I, I think we could, we could have reasonably gotten both poles. Right. We just picked the wrong drivers. We did. So for sprint Oops. pole, it was Oscar. You had Lando. I had Max. So you know, um, Oops. it was fine. A sprint podium was okay. This is what I'm kind of upset about because I had Oscar winning, and Oscar should have won. And if McLaren yeah. swapped it, and that was the only thing that I was missing, I would have still given myself the points because truly he <laughs> wanted my book. Um, so the sprint podium was Lando, Oscar, Charles. You had well, Carlos. well, remember it was originally Lando, Oscar, Max, right? But then Max blew it, and he got that penalty. Yes, 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 yes. Oops. So it ended up being Lando, Oscar, Lando, Oscar Charles. Charles. You had Carlos, Max, Lando. I had Oscar, Charles, Lewis, and I would just like to point out again, Carlos finished p5 and that is again. the only place he will finish in sprint weekends i can't um, wait to see him do it again in qatar oh god and then so for sprint p8 was checo you had lawson i had k mags um, before which, we knew that k mags was sick and i would have race. supplemented ollie there and whoever's driving the car is my pick had had ollie gotten it i would have given you that point i would have just taken it I don't know, I know where we're keeping points, but I would have given myself points. <laughs> um, I am the keeper of the spreadsheet. <laughs> and then, okay, for the actual Grand Prix, poll was Lando, which happened this morning, which was crazy. And we both had Charles, which that was not going to happen. Nope. Um, and then for Podium, I don't think I would have ever picked this in my entire life. I would have given limbs to someone, if you said this is what it was going to be, I'd be like, yeah, sure. It was Max, Esteban, and then Pierre. You had Carlos, Charles, Max. I had Charles, Carlos, George. George wasn't far off. George was right off the podium, but Charles and Carlos were 
nowhere close. Nowhere. And then P10 was Lewis. You had Albon, who didn't even race. And nope. I had Fernando, who barely made it oh, across poor Fernando. the finish line. So. Let, let's, let's talk about Fernando for a second, because that poor man, he crashed in qualifying. He has his, oh, undi- his, his undisclosed intestinal illness that he had to fly all the way to Europe and back for. And his radio call at the end of the race was just like, I'm going to finish this for the mechanics who did an amazing job this weekend, but oh my God, my back is killing me. That poor guy. <laughs> yeah. Poor, and poor he man. like, he, he needed a minute and also may have needed like some support in order to actually get out of his car. There's some video floating around on social yeah. media of it. It took him some time to get out of the car at the end of that race poor buddy yeah that's what happens when you're he, what, he need- 44 years old 43 years old he's kid? i think he's like 42 okay well whatever the, yeah the g-force is age you the, um, the the point is is that man is tired and he needs a break yeah okay going into our biggest surprise Catherine, you said there would be five or fewer dnfs which technically yes we had two dnss two retirements and one disqualification so and i would have been shocked if there were less than that yeah so kind of ish um and then i said i was gonna get double points and uh, no. that didn't happen um unfortunately and then who's gonna do a dumb sad i'm kind of upset that mine didn't come true but i feel like the weather and like the weird quality definitely had something to do with it because they weren't really even in the chance to fight because i said max and lando we're gonna go at it again um had they had they had the opportunity to fight this 100 this would have 100 percent, 100 percent. and the whole entire grid would have crashed behind them because they would have just destroyed right especially in this weather um and then you said that red bull is going to continue to shoot itself in the foot grand prix well no. i'd say checo kind of shot himself in the foot when he took the corner and he oh i was went fully fully writing this in like the max side of the garage like i wasn't <laughs> we, even we thinking about Checo. Checo exists, but sprint race yes because he had some um oopsies he, he had he had one pretty significant oopsie and i mean honestly perez did get a point in the sprint so he, he didn't come out of this weekend completely pointless one just mostly pointless. Po- actually no i think he got two because he had fastest lap for sprint <laughs> i think he got um, two points this weekend you don't get a point for fastest lap in the sprint race. Are you sure? Because I thought they said that he got two points. Um, I'm Let's not sure this anymore. Live. We're we're checking. While we, you fact we, check, we are I will checking. Have, I will recap. We'll kill all the birds with one keyboard. Um, yeah, there's no fastest lap in the sprint. Okay, I lied. He only got one measly point. Again, yeah. nail coffin. Done. Final one would thoughts. Think. I love when weather plays a role in the race. I don't like when it's the main character. And I feel like the weather was definitely main character energy and just really through everyone's weekend, which applaud the drivers for, you know, taking that, running with it, doing the best they can. But I do think it took away from some of like the good racing that we generally see in Brazil. Yeah, I mean, there it's... It's one thing to have a wet track. It's another thing to have a track that is so wet that you have Max miming in the garage of just how much water there is on track and how his tires feel like he's on, he's, you know, on a boat instead of in a car. So yeah, it was the, the rain was a lot. I was very cranky toward the end of qualifying after we kept getting red flags because I was very tired because it was like 4 30 in the morning and they were still going and qualifying because qualifying didn't end until about 5 a.m my time and I'm a person who likes to sleep I could not fall asleep after qualifying and that upset me especially since the race was then pushed earlier so I still had to wake up early again um and so this is like a fully first world me thing problem but like y'all not my favorite portion of today. Uh, yeah, it was a rough one. Yeah. But looking on a brighter note, I have my off track moment from the weekend. And I was worried this wouldn't happen because of I all was the rescheduling. Too. But Lewis drove Senna's McLaren. And it was just kind of like a really heartwarming, cool thing to see. Again, Lewis has really strong ties to Senna's family and to him as a driver he used to drive for McLaren so I think it was just a really special moment for him and and for the fans and like to see it and also 
kind of a connection to us, not really, but a little bit. Rebecca Andrade was the one who waved the checkered flag when he was driving. She is the Brazilian gymnast who beat out Simone Biles on floor. She also came in, like, she got silver all around. She's absolute superstar. I love her. She's one of the best gymnast- gymnasts in the world. If you yeah, if you she's don't like follow international right behind Simone gymnast. Biles, it's her. So yeah, um, yeah, super cool to see that. But yeah, I just I thought that was kind. of, I know it's not technically off track, but it's not a racing moment. So I'm really it's glad that they were adjacent. able to to pull it out and still have that um, happen for both Lewis and for the fans to see. So it was, it was actually Senna's car that he was driving, which that doesn't happen all the time. So yeah, it, 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 it was. Cool. Like, yeah, sometimes they're like replica cars, but that was like an actual car from the 1990 season that Senna won the championship in. It was Lewis dro- drove the car. Also, Bruno Senna, who is related to Ayrton Senna, he drove the car with Lewis's helmet. There were pictures with Lewis with other members of the Senna family. Like they're they're all very very close. They they've got a, a very close relationship there, and it's. It was, it was really, it was something that I, I was really worried that wasn't going to happen because this was originally supposed to happen after qualifying on Saturday. So yeah. the fact that they were able to sneak it in and keep it in the weekend just because of everything that, you know, Senna means to the sport and, you know, this being the anniversary of his passing, it's, I'm really glad it was able to happen. Same, 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 same. It's great when things work out like they're supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, coming up next, TBD. Great (laughs) question. We have a three-week break that we don't know what to do with ourselves. We had our summer break. We had our fall break. Let's call this winter break, if you will, (laughs) even though we'll have another winter break. This is fall break part two. I don't know. So, yeah, we have some time before Vegas. I will not be participating in Vegas or Qatar. Um, I will be unreachable on a deserted island um yes. not deserted but on an island so yeah this is my last race until our finale but I'm sure we'll have another episode coming out soon but it'll be a surprise we'll, we'll, we'll do a little <laughs> f101 episode of something or other that we'll figure out this week or you know and- what maybe by then we'll know who's in the last seats and then we'll just be able to do a whole 2025 episode to really just hammer home. Get us ready for the future. The future. <laughs> yes, because as you know, if you've listened, listened to enough episodes, we only talk about the future on this podcast. And we only talk about 2025 and we only talk about 2026 and beyond. So, And I can't we'll wait for see. next season to only talk about Audi coming to the track in 2026. And, then, and the new regulations because 2025 is going to be the end of a regulation. But yes, we, will, we might have an F101 out for you guys before Vegas. If not, we will see you the week of Vegas with some Vegas predictions with me and a host to be named at some point in the not too distant future yep 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 oh well what a weekend I think I need to you know sit and with my thoughts and just let my heart rate kind of go down yeah (laughs) this was this was a lot and I and and before we stop recording I'm just gonna do one last check to see if if there are any up uh, up here we go. We have an oh, update. We have an update. We have it th- as of two minutes ago. Uh, no Norris has been punished following an investigation by the Sao Paulo Grand Prix stewards for a potential infringement in the aborted start procedure. Lando was given a reprimand and fined 5,000 euros by the FIA. He was not alone in receiving a reprimand as three other cars followed him, which was Yuki, Liam, and George, but he was the only one to be financially penalized. So basically, Basically, it was it. a whole he nothing burger <laughs> because he started it. So, so there is that. We still do not know yet about the decisions for George and Lewis and the technical breach that may or may not have happened. So we will mention that on social media at, at going.off.track on Instagram and on our YouTube channel where you're probably already watching this in the community page, if I remember. But yeah, keep an eye out. It really isn't going to have that much of an impact other than the fact that, you know, this is going to be, this, this could potentially be Lewis's second uh, disqualification from a race in two seasons, which is something that doesn't happen very often. So it's funny. Do you ever feel like the FIA's decisions 
and like reprimands are completely arbitrary and they kind of follow Michael Scott on Survivor Day when he's like when he asks Pam like who is in first place and she's like well you gave someone a gold star someone 100 points and then someone a high five so I'm really not sure like that's how I feel (laughs) the FIA hands out and doles out their reprimands it's like oh yes it's the same but it's not but like to us it is anyways I I don't disagree because (laughs) because as we said, Max got points on his license for saying a bad word in a press conference and Charles got a fine. Dot, dot, dot. And Charles doesn't have to do community service. And Charles doesn't have to. (laughs) Max is not, let's be real, Max is not doing community service. Sebastian Vettel is going to do Max's community service. Can can you leave someone to volunteer for him and said that will just get all the hours or he will just like volunteer with he Seb. will deputize Seb Vettel to do his community <laughs> also um I want to point out that Max had to win this race today because Yoss Verstappen was there in the garage and Yoss would have made Max walk back to Europe from Brazil had he not won the race so he would have had to swim he would have had to swim the Atlantic in order to to get back to Monaco had he not won the race so it's a good thing that he did yes yes thanks thanks Yoss well with that update that is our Sao Paulo recap things are going off track with us guys